This is the DTV Digest, the podcast that brings you news and reviews of films which didn't make it to the cinema. And now, here's your host, Mike Parkin. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the DTV Digest, the podcast which brings you reviews of films which didn't make it to the cinema and instead went straight to DVD, Blu-ray, or streaming media. I'm your host, Mike Parkin, and joining me this week are Stephen Lockridge. Hello. And Richard Hawes. Hello, everybody. And this week, we've got three main reviews for you. We're going to kick off with Rogue, move on to Ropes, and end with Skyfire. Our short shot this week is Dead Air, and our DTV throwback is Danger Zone. So without further ado, let's crack on. Our first review then is Rogue. Megan Fox plays Samantha O'Hara, the leader of a team of mercenaries hired to rescue a diplomat's daughter in a remote region of Africa. Although they manage to grab the girl, their exit is cut off and the group have to take refuge in a seemingly deserted lion farm. Except there is still one lion roaming the premises. Okay, guys, this is Megan Fox's attempt at sort of butching up her image a bit, um, ditching the sort of like, you know, the, the pin-up girl um, Transformers uh, kind of image that was uh, cultivated by Michael Bay. Um, she's sort of joined up with director uh, MJ Bassett, who also did uh, Solomon Kane and Strike Back. <laughs> and she's co-starring with Philip Winchester, also of Strike Back. I think this gets most stuff right. I, re I reckon it's about 80% there um, overall. I think the action is very well shot. Um, I do have a couple of reservations, um, particularly in the area of the CGI lion, unfortunately. But my, overall, this was a very entertaining film. So, Steve, what do you reckon of this? Yep. Pretty much agree with you. It's I enjoyed the performances. I wasn't too keen on the switch of tone. You know, you get the first twenty minutes where it's like a jaunty little action film, and then all of a sudden it turns into like a like a haunted house horror type mm. thing in a way. Um, but yeah, I agree with you on the CGI. It's probably some of the worst CGI I've seen for a long while. Um, with like, and obviously they try to disguise it so much with, with like the night vision goggles and the darkness and everything like that. But <clears throat> it, it 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 works, you know. It's it's fun. I think it's a little bit too serious near the end, and the ending's a little bit of a letdown for me, really. But yeah, it's it's, it's okay. It's not bad. Mm. Rich, when we when we um, covered um, Prey recently, the Dick Maas film from um, the Netherlands, yes, um, I, I think we discovered that that they were saying the um, in in order to do a full CGI line for the film would be inordinately expensive. So so it was actually cheaper for them to do sort of like uh, animatronics, and he kind of wished this film had gone down the same route. Yeah, yeah, the. Um, uh there's a lot more um there there's a little bit of up close animatronics i think mm. here but you know not a huge amount like you say it's very reliant on the cgi and unfortunately from the opening scene what you what to expect is very much laid bare and mm. that is a real shame because the I, I agree with you uh that for the most part very solid uh, I've heard a lot of very negative things, you know, people saying it's the worst film they've seen in the year and stuff like that. And I think the main problem is the CGI it completely lets it down. It's a beautifully shot film, yeah. great locations on set in South Africa. Yeah. Uh, very good use of the, I mean, very, you know, cinematic looking film, you know, it's not a cheap movie, but the CGI is just ropey as hell. Yeah. Uh, as, yeah. As, as I mentioned, the, the director was MJ Bassett, who, um, done a lot of uh, work on, on this TV series Strike Back, um, which is renowned for its excellent action scenes and um, definitely picks up a lot of uh, influence from that, you know, that, that whole opening sequence, uh, for example. And it's, um, sort that of is night funny night. because when I was watching it, I was thinking, oh, this is like a Strike Back kind of thing. So <laughs> it's quite funny to 
to learn that. Yeah. Um, mm. Yeah, it, it has has that sort of level of quality to it. My, my only complaint, and, and I, I do like Megan Fox in this role uh, for the most part. Um, my, my only issue is that really she shouldn't have started off as the leader of the gang because I, I don't think she's... She, I don't think she carries enough gravitas. You know, she doesn't seem seasoned enough to be leading this group. I, I can imagine her as being, you know, sort of second in command or something, and then somebody yeah. gets killed and she has to take over. Yeah, I can I see that sort of thing. But you know, may, maybe sort of ten years down the line, she yeah, I I I, I would believe her in this in this role. Um, but she's good. You know, she 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 knows one end of the gun from the other. She she looks comfortable with it. Um, you know, she's obviously done a lot of pre-training and that sort of thing, but I, I think, you know, plot-wise, it probably would have helped if she didn't start off leading the, the team. And I think you're right again. Mm. I think that would have been a very good way to develop it. I didn't have a, I didn't have a huge problem with her as the leader of the group. No. But as as you say, you know, she's very young. She's very fresh-faced. She doesn't she doesn't look like she's been through the wars, which mm. she's supposed to have done. Um, so yeah, I, th I think um, you know you have to take a, a, a heavy pinch of salt with that. I thought the supporting guys were really good. There's a there's a couple of dramatic uh, scenes, particularly the the, um, the moment when well we, we have to set this up first. So the um, the idea is that they are on an extraction mission, uh, and they're after the uh, a rich man's daughter uh, who's being human trafficked, and then the human traffickers are basically pursuing them. Mm. Uh, they're the human mm. threat alongside the uh, the animal threat uh, uh, as the story unfolds. And so there's one scene that takes place where one of the heroes, one of the group of mercenaries, is revealed to be a former member of the group that is involved in the um, um, the human trafficking. And the victims are suitably uh, peeved about this uh, and uh, you know big discussions and whatever uh, and take place and I thought that was really good and the guy playing that gang that former gang member was brilliant I thought yeah, uh, the, the, yeah. Uh, there's there's some good dynamics with all of those guys you know the um the sort of the, the lead guys and there's some humor in that that they throw in it's a bit of a delicate thing because some of the some parts get really heavy and then other parts are like really light so the, the humor mm. It offers some levity, but at the same time, it, it seems a uh, a bit out of place at times. Mm. I would say, but yeah, yeah well, this is really decent. <clears throat> I think you know, like they say that. Oh, I was where I'm looking for. Sorry, um, you know, you're a mercenary. You're living in a dark world. You know, like doctors, they use quite dark humour to get through things. That's you true. know, what I mean, yeah. kind of a bit like that. I mean. The, like, like the Chinese lad, <laughs> yeah, like the Chinese lad in the other block keeps singing the backstreet. Mm -hmm. back back song. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, <laughs> it gets stuck in your head, it really does. <laughs> yeah, it was cre that, that, that was creasing me up, you know. I mm. really enjoyed that that part. And like Rich was saying, the um, the part with the former militia soldier and the, and the, the hostage, I thought was really, really good. Um, and again, I think the Megan Fox thing, I think they've tried to, to take her away from, if she was kind of second in command and then built her way up, I think they've just tried to get her away from like being like a Ripley type character, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It comes from the forefront. I think they just wanted her bang out the front. Yeah, she probably does look a bit too young and not result enough to, to actually be the leader, but... She, she, I think she's really good in it. She does work. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You don't, you don't, she, don't, you know, she doesn't come across the sort of like, you know, uh, I'm, I'm thinking sort of Pamela Anderson in Barbed Wire or something like that. You know, mm. she, you, you do get the feeling that yeah, she, she, she knows what she's doing here. You know, yeah. in, in this sort of in this place, so she, she's comfortable on the battlefield sort of thing. But yeah, it's it's, it's just that sort of fresh facedness of it. I think. You know, she'd been a bit sort of mm. more dirtied up or something that maybe it would it would have fit more. But you know, it, it, it's we're, we're we're nitpicking is what we're doing really. Yeah. So, but um, overall, I thought this was great fun. Yeah. Yeah, it's just those blooming CGI lines. animals, <laughs> CGI muzzle flashes, that awful jumping off a cliff scene. Mm. 
where they were just yeah. like blurry things coming down. You compare that. I mean, this is basically a, a, if anyone saw the Nicolas Cage film Primal, that's a, sort of a comparable right. kind of movie. But this is basically Extraction crossed with Primal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And obviously in Extraction, you've got that really memorable, like hot, really impressive shot where mm. uh, Chris Hemsworth jumps uh, off the off the cliff into into the water and stuff. And this is like the complete opposite of that yeah. in terms of quality. <laughs> just, but just in that scene, the rest of it is really nicely, really nicely done. There's some, for some reason, I don't know if they lost money on it. There was a film that um, Russell Mulcahy made uh, called uh, Talos the Mummy, also known as Tale of the Mummy. Oh yeah. Which was a big budget mm. mummy film that came, that came around the same time as the Stephen Summers, Brendan Fraser mm. Uh, but it got completely sort of overlooked because of that. But it had a great British cast and stuff, you know, put money and everything on it. But they really cut corners on the CG and it was absolutely awful. And that, I mean, this CG isn't as bad as it was in, in there, but that it was comparable because that was like 20, uh, 20, well, yeah, 20 years ago. So, mm. so you know, I, th I think I've got a copy of that on DVD that I never watched. Oh, we, should, we should definitely look at it. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty, pretty sure I, like, I got sent it as a sort of promotional thing. And it's I've got two versions because I've got the because there are two edits of it. There's All right. The, there's the original cut, and then there's like the Weinstein edit <laughs> so, uh, from the Miramax <laughs> days. So that's like uh, they reordered the scenes and put them in. The thing is, the the, the Weinstein version is in widescreen. The original version I can only get in full screen. Pan and scan. <laughs> yeah. Pan and yeah. scan, yeah, which is from uh, from China or something. But uh, yeah, he's, it's not really properly available. Anyway, complete digression. Indeed. Um, that, uh, yeah, in, in terms of if you liked, you know, Primal, we haven't really had a chance to cover that properly on the show, I don't think. We did discuss it, but that kind of became a bit of a lost mm. episode thing, I think. That was but, a Nick Cage episode we did, not yeah, it? Yeah, so we, we will revisit that at some point. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, if you like Primal, if you like Extraction, and you like, you know, military stuff and animal stuff, I think you'll get a lot out of this. You just have yeah. to be prepared to sort of suck her up, suck up the, uh, the bad CGI. Yeah, it gets a lot of stuff right. The firefights and things, you know, all all looks really good. And you know, if you're a fan of Strike Back and that sort of action, then this should be up your boat. So scores on the doors, guys. I'm definitely giving this a strong seven out of ten. Yeah, I've got over seven, and I will join you on a seven. Awesome, three sevens for Rogue. Our next review then is Ropes. After being in a horrific car accident which killed her sister and left her a quadriplegic, quadriplegic, I'm carrying on, Elena is brought by her father back to her family home, which he is having renovated to give her some independence. He has also brought home Athos, a dog trained to be her helper. When poor Athos is bitten by a, a bat, however, he becomes rabid and Eleanor finds herself trapped and must somehow fend for herself within the house. Uh, okay, so this is a Spanish film and um, we have a young lady um, who is trapped in a wheelchair. She can barely move one arm and the title, I guess, comes from the fact that her father has sort of tied ropes to each door handle to give her some, you know, some way of actually getting doors open. It's um, a very interesting film, almost a two-hander, her um, sort of uh, Elena and um, Athos. Um, Rich, what did you make of this? I thought it was interesting that the that we positioned this and Rogue together that by complete accident. They're basically uh, very similar, uh, but completely opposite. So instead of uh, a huge, a, a big group, a group of people trapped with a lion, we've got one person alone trapped with a dog. Uh, and uh, the the threat is no worse for the fact that it is a dog in this case, because uh, he, you know, he's, he, he's and when he becomes rabid, he, he's just uh, he's just full on like Cujo basically. So Cujo with smarts though, isn't he? Because he's because yeah. he's been trained, yeah, he's you know, very, he's a very, very intelligent well, dog. Yeah. But now insane. It's, it's almost like having your dog turn into Joker, basically. Yeah, and I think there's a similar thing going on with you know comparing it in terms of CGI. I think this one they've gone they've got an actual dog which helps, mm. uh, and there are a few instances of CGI. There's some bits where I think the dog is probably more enhanced than replaced. Mm. Uh, there are some scenes that that seem like they probably overlaid some bits onto onto the dog. And that, which I think works a lot better. Um, there's, 
the the concept itself you know having just that one character i'll be honest i did sort of drift away at times because it's quite a, you know it, it would suit a short film very well mm. but you know trying to do an hour and a half with one character who's who doesn't really speak because she's by herself and can't move you know, that's that's quite challenging in terms of the storytelling but they they did they did well i think the uh, cinematography is very nice it's not as you know it's not a particularly ex a pretty location most of it's in, inside the house we don't really see much of the area but it's got a very enigmatic opening that gets you quite intrigued you know where you see a little snip of, of bits and then you, you are left to put the puzzle pieces together and then there's a little time a little bit of exposition and then we're properly into the uh, into the horror tale yeah uh, there's another character who's a little ferret called Luke and He's quite fun to see wandering about until, unfortunately, he gets a bit sick. Uh, uh, there was some stuff that happened with him, which I thought uh, didn't work so well. Um, I thought for perhaps was more unintentionally funny than uh, having any great impact. The lead performer, she was very good. You know, again, it's, it's, it's quite a challenging role for an actor to, yeah. to try and do something where they're completely immobile. Uh, you know, because she's got these ropes that are hanging around, but they're for the dog to use. She can't use them. Yeah, she they're, they're barely within reach, are they? Oh, it's 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 so yeah, tantalising basically. Yeah, so, so she has to be quite resourceful. Um, I think I've said enough. I think I'll pass over to Steve. Steve, now. yeah. Um, I was bored to tears with this, to be honest with you. <laughs> I found it very slow. I thought the threat was only about two times in the movie there's a bit of a threat with the dog it <clears throat> I, I just thought it, it veers from not to two very quickly with with <laughs> what happened with the dog and then it's basically uh, just trying to move around the house mm. find a phone open doors and that was it, it just nothing really else happened I mean, the bit, like Rich was saying, the bit with the ferret was farcical. It really was. And, again, how it was just dealt with. It's one of them where, you know, the trapped, and it's going to be the same. She could have really, what she did at the end could have been done about two hours earlier, if you know what I mean. And it wouldn't have made any difference to the film whatsoever. And I thought the performance was great. But like we was saying, as a short half hour, 20 minutes, fair enough. But dragging it out over an hour and a half, I just thought it was it was just too much. Steve, how do you feel about the psychological horror sort of dream, dreamy bits? Again, I don't think it was needed. It it explained it a bit better i think that's it was just there for exposition to explain what had happened to her and how she got in in the chair as such and and that's all it was i mean the bit with her father at the beginning how she ends up getting stuck in the situation to be fair i suppose it could happen but it was just a bit too convenient as well how it happened and how she ends up in the situation and oh, oh yeah it's very much a if it can go wrong it does go wrong kind of thing it's yeah like, yeah exactly yeah what are the chances yeah the the, the 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 assistant dog gets you know turned like within a second like <laughs> as if they bumped yeah. it as if they run into a zombie and uh yeah, yeah and then what happens with her father and Stuff. There's, there's another interesting bit in that. Where towards the towards the end of the film, she finds a letter that her dad had left. Letter, yeah, which which was in her sister's room, the room that yeah. she would have never ever have gone into if if she could avoid it, but was kind mm. of forced into it. So he'd left it in there. So she wasn't going to find that letter for ages if if, if you know if, if sort of nature had taken its course. But in the letter, he sort of says, "Oh, and that's why I stopped the renovations to the house." You know, because yeah. he was in the middle of getting the house ready for her to arrive, 
so that she could move around properly so that you know like um like a handicap ramp to get in and out of the house and things which he hadn't bothered to do <laughs> you know the, the one thing he had done was put the ropes on the doors and um and, and put the stair lift in mm. basically but everything else he's like oh, I don't I don't want to sort of mess around with the house too much at the moment it's like well yeah well great thanks very much dad <laughs> <You know? laughs> um yeah so so I mean it was just it was just just like the, you know the ending was tapped on just to explain it Give, you know, here's the exposition with the letter, with what happened with the sister, you know, coming back. And uh, it, it, I, I was literally bored to see it. I can't say I was bored. Um, well, like there, I, say, I, was, I was more like Steve. I was checking my phone. Yeah, well, that, that's just part of the course for reviewing films, unfortunately. <laughs> but um, <laughs> there, there were moments like, um, you know, when, when she's trying to move something off like, like like the phone at the beginning when she's you know and she's sort of moving forward and backing up and moving forward and backing up and it it reminded me of a lot of stuff you see on like the simpsons and family guy where they they do this sort of routine and just keep doing it and doing it and doing it you know it, mm. it until it stops being funny and then becomes funny again kind of thing you know yeah so, it's like when peter when peter fights a chicken yeah that sort of thing you know it's yeah. just, it's just like you know, is 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 this ever going to you know come to anything? Um, I, I I thought the the ferret bit was um, some a nice bit of levity actually in, in the proceedings. Um, I did feel for the character a lot as uh, without yeah. give without giving anything away. I was just thinking I don't think she had enough speed to accomplish. <laughs> no, what she, not not what a chance. No. <laughs> but I'll leave it at that. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, there, there were some interesting sort of elements, you know, um, the fact that she's sort of strapped into this this chair, you know, this electric wheelchair. So immediately I'm thinking, how long is that battery going to last? You know, that's well, going to have to come well, into play at some point. It, don't they, at the beginning, yeah. they say about the battery. Yeah. Mm. And, I, and again, yeah, the way that unfolds, mm. that's a bit convenient, isn't it, as well? But the, you know, the, her, her movements and everything, you know, so they, they established, you know, they, I think they do a good job of establishing exactly what her limitations are you know and what what she can do what she can and can't do um so yeah that was all in, impressive um I, I think the film benefits from a good if, if you've got a good sound system like surround sound or if you're going to watch it on headphones um there's a particularly really good bit where the dog gets into the house he gets, he does a die hard and gets into the heating ducts and <laughs> you know but it's it, it's it's really good because when you're listening to it and he, you know the um the sound is all, like, all over the house he so he, he can track where the dog's going sort of through the house um by, by this by the sounds of, of it sort of going down these ducts which is quite amusing but it but it works really well to sort of um with a decent sort of bit of surround sound um, okay, I think that's, you know, without getting into any sort of spoilers, I think that's where we'll leave it with ropes, uh, scores on the doors for Rich. I think I'm, I'm going to go just a light six on this one, I think. Mm -hmm. And Steve? I'm going to go four. A four. I'm going to join Rich on a yeah. six. Um, I think, yeah, the opening bit is, is, I think it's a bit overly morose. To begin with, it, it does take a while, but then things happen in quite quick succession, um, and uh, yeah, it does sort of. You know, the middle bit is is pretty decent. So yeah, so two sixes and a four for ropes. Our next review is Skyfire. As a child, Meng Li saw firsthand the terrifying destructive power of an erupting volcano on the island of Chan Hu, which, which tragically took her mother's life. 20 years later, Meng has followed in her mother's footsteps, studying the volcano while entrepreneur Jack Harris has built a five-star resort on the island, complete with a monorail which runs through the volcano crater. When Ming discovers, sorry, when Meng discovers that the volcano might erupt, she tries to warn Jack of the imminent danger, but to no avail. 
So this is directed by Simon West. It's, it's, a, um, it's a Chinese production directed by Simon West, best known for things like Tomb Raider and Con Air, and uh, stars Jason Isaacs as Jack Harris, the entrepreneur. And a supporting character. We as say. a supporting character, yeah. He, mm -hmm. He's the sort of the mayor of Jaws, basically, isn't he? He is, yeah. He is. Um, <laughs> and then we've got Hannah Qu uh, Quinlian, who was also in the Shanghai job with uh, Orlando Bloom, a uh, film oh, we yes. covered a while back. Yeah. Um, so th this is classic disaster movie territory, this is. Um, oddly enough, I'd, I'd watched Dante's Peak sort of yeah. last month with my son, um, and, and this sort of follows a lot of the same sort of beats, really. Is it, it you know, you've got that opening bit, but you know, the sort of big disaster bit at the beginning to sort of get you in the mood, and then it sort of quietens down, and then it's like, you know, there's a volcano going to erupt. Oh, no, it isn't. You can't, can't warn people. So it follows the usual sort of beats of a disaster movie, but I think it does it with a plum, basically. Um, when things kick off, they kick off big style, you know, there's, there's people are plenty getting killed and crushed and burnt alive and all the rest of it so i i was happy as larry watching this uh steve what did you make of it i thought it was cracking really did it's straight in there no messing about and then it just goes from there i thought the effects were were absolutely brilliant it was completely unexpected how well it was shot i mean i know it's simon west and you know, he's done like, like you say, Con Air, Tomb Raider, and you know things like that. But I've not really heard anything from me for a while. Mm. And yet, yeah, it follows all all disaster movie tropes, trying to you know rescue the old grandparent and do this and do that. It, it it's kind of like Jurassic Park in a way. Absolutely, yeah. You know, mm. let's let's build a bloody luxury resort next to a volcano because it's going to be great but it's just fun it's just a cracking romp of a film i really really enjoyed it mm. same here um rich over to you yeah i i too uh, felt the jurassic park thing i mean it is as you and you mentioned dante's peak so i was thinking you know it's jurassic park meets dante's peak <laughs> but, you know it, it touches on all those um, disaster movie cliches as you've said i mean uh, Irwin Allen did like way back in the seventies when time ran out. Uh, I think was it Krakatoa is the Jawa? Was yeah. that a mm -hmm. yeah. as well? Uh, and like and say more recently Dante's Peak and the uh, Tommy Lee Jones one Volcano. Yeah. So volcanoes are like one of the top disaster movie scenarios. So the, the, the what, what new could they bring to it? Oh, okay. So this time. They're building a resort around what they know is an accident <laughs> volcano, <laughs> mm. uh, which is completely absurd. But hey, you know it all works to the to the fun. I think the the character of Jack Harris, played by Jason Isaacs, as a South African, mm. I should say, um, mm. I thought was really good because yes, he is the mayor of Jaws, but in a different way because he's financially completely invested. It's it's all you know he he's his his career and livelihood is sort of on the line in this uh, investment uh, so he it's in his best interest that it sort of stays open and works and that, so he's in denial of it there but he's not a completely heartless bastard no that's right yeah no 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 he, 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 he does get that brilliant bit of redemption yeah mm. you know um and it is almost as if he's thinking well if I, if I can do one good good thing you know do one good thing out of this you know that's my legacy sort of thing but but no that, you, that really works yeah the in terms of like, like Steve was saying, and that, you know, it is like full on, you know, the, the disaster movies are usually quite baggy, uh, mm. especially with human drama and stuff. And they're usually about two, two hours, two and a half hours or whatever. This one's 90 minutes, pretty much. Uh, mm. It's like, it's like straight through, no, no mess. I mean, there is the human drama, but I think that's well played and it's not over egged, but the, um, there's a, cause the heart of the story is uh, the young girl who um, lost her mother in the prologue. Uh, and we thought she'd lost her father, but she's grown up uh, and she's kind of obsessed with completing mm. her work and her dad's kind of like, we doesn't really want her too much involved in it. But so there's that, their relationship has to be resolved. I loved his character and his performance. Uh, mm. the, uh, the father, the professor, he was great, very resourceful, some great stuff they do with his character. Uh, so he was 
really good. I thought all the casts were good. There's there's the usual supporting players of various having various relationships. Well, so like, there's there's the young couple as well, and I must admit, I thought I thought they were not long for this earth. You know exactly. <laughs> Because yeah, it's, yeah. it's the Dante's Peak um, yeah, spa yeah. scene, isn't it? It's like yeah. we're getting in all the hot springs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was like, oh, God, no. And that but, scene um, has ended up being a bit more elaborate. I mean, for the minute, he's hmm. proposing and taking her under the sea and stuff. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, it was quite, a, a, quite a big sequence. Um, and that's what happens with them. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, all the set pieces, I mean, the whole part about the... Uh, uh, the cable car or monorail, oh, yeah, the monorail going yeah. around, yeah. not only up and around to the top of the volcano, but then once you're at the top of the volcano, you get off and you get in a yeah, in a pole sort of lift thing, yeah, yeah, that takes you into yeah. the volcano, and then it all kicks off, and so you've got this massive sort of escape kind of chase sequence, which I'm unfo- which it's awful, but you know, entertaining at the same time, but it's. Yeah. The most ridiculous survival scenario. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they literally, with no harnesses or anything, are just rocketed mm. straight down a mountainside and then not a barely a scratch on them. <laughs> no, yeah. not even a scratch, I don't think. <laughs> um, so it is very cartoonish in that sense, but very yeah. entertaining. I like the static electricity carbon. In- yeah, yeah. That, that was an interesting yeah. touch. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's not. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I mean, not something I've ever known. Is is, is that an actual thing or what? Mm. Or I imagine so. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. The, okay. the other the bit, I mean, the, you know, the other sort of set piece was um, with the um, the Land Rover when it sort of falls into yes. the lava flow. Which, which yeah. was, and that, that was an interesting sort of, you know, um, callback to um, Dante's Peak, you know, funny, enough, again, I, I was watching the um, the good, bad flicks version, you know, that they're sort of round up and yeah. they're sort of taking the piss out of it for the fact that, you know, the Land Rover tire has managed to sort of drive over sort yeah. of molten lava. And yeah. of course, this time it was like, no, this, they're, they're stuck. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Yeah. Which I thought was great. And how they, they get out of that sequence, I thought was superb, you know. Which they then combine mm. with, I think it's the hanging jeep sequence from uh, the Lost World. Lost World, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well. So there's yeah. lots of little references and callbacks, mm. and it's all done very professionally. Now, as as Steve was saying, you know, the the visual effects in this are top mm. top class. You know, that we, yeah. the um, the, how they how it, you know, the whole idea of you know Hollywood directors and you know people working in uh, a cinema that isn't their natural na- nat- native language is quite interesting because you know we see like uh, we haven't seen any Rennie Harlan's films yet but he he went over to China and Simon West's gone over to China and um, we think oh how strange that is but you know China is kind of this massively emerging you know filmmaking yeah. Oh, yeah. center and we don't think twice when somebody from China goes to America to make a film in the yeah, language. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's really no different at all. Uh, so it's, it's just a uh, things kind of spun. And I was thinking, you know, of all the directors, I think who, who might be sort of next on the cards to do that. I think Michael Bay w- would be because he's already dipped his toe in the water with one of the Transformers movies. That's true. And yeah. His mm. aesthetic, I think, you know, if they wanted to make a big blockbuster. You know, they the producers would easily, um, you know, come to him for you know because he's making films for like Netflix and stuff now. You know, it's mm. not it's not like yeah. he's um, unavailable to to try those sort of things. I think he goes where the money is, and so I, I wouldn't be surprised if if we see him do a big blockbuster in China. Yeah. But in Simon West has done a cracking job with this one. Yeah, mm. there's um there's a book I read a couple of years ago called The Great Zoo of China by Matthew Riley. He's a, he's, a, he's a very good sort of Michael Crichton style writer, you know, sort of, sort of airport novel sort of page turner. Mm-hmm. But that one sort of stood out um, where uh, it's kind of like Jurassic Park, but sort of China has managed to sort of get its hold on some actual dragon eggs and, and sort of grow them. And this is very similar to that. If you swap the volcano out for the dragons, it mm-hmm. would be very similar. And I'm thinking, damn, you know, I wish maybe get someone to make that film with you know with this cast that'd be brilliant well that'd be like dragon wars yeah. cross with cross with yeah. this that'd yeah. be amazing 
it would it's, it's a really good book actually so yeah but um yeah this, this is great i've actually got this on on order of blu-ray um because well, i had it on order from the time i saw the trailer but having watched this sort of screener we got sent you know that hasn't changed my mind at all um well, it's no surprise with, in terms of the visual yeah. the visual dimension to the film and the, and the high quality of it you know it's a natural it's gonna be it. great yeah watching it on the big tv yeah. and stuff so scores on the doors for skyfire guys i've got to give this one a good eight yes yep. i'm gonna go eight as well yep very high eight mm -hmm. i yeah, just Sky... want to add a couple of things at the end mm -hmm. is that it ends with a covid19 heroes dedication yeah that was interesting yeah uh, and a music video with and a music video, yeah. Which is kind of, a, I guess, oh, that's a typically ah. Chinese thing. Yeah, but well, that, that that's sort of like oh. that, you know, what's it saying that that made me think? Yes, it, this was obviously a a big summer blockbuster for you know in in China. Well, that was, that, that was it, what it was intended to be, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like a bloody Linkin Park. What I've done video, you know, that was mm. in Transformers. It, it's exactly the same. It's just. Chinese lads, you know what I mean? So it was, yeah, that went straight off. <laughs> yeah, but no, it, it, interesting. Anyway, it'd be interesting to see what's on the Blu-ray to see if they've got the proper music video and stuff. Mm. There you go. I didn't yes. like the song. <laughs> <Go on. laughs> didn't like the song. Anything else, no. Rich? Uh, no, uh, I was to say, yeah, but massively mm -hmm. uh, entertaining. This is the first film to come out from a new distributor uh, who unfortunately his name escapes me now, but uh, Patriot, that was it, Patriot Films. So, Patriot Films, yeah. Uh, this is on uh, uh, DVD and Blu-ray from them. I'm not sure about its digital availability, but I presume if, if, if by the time you're listening to this, if it's not on uh, VOD or yeah, electronic you know, mm -hmm. availability, it will probably turn up on Netflix. I mean, it seems like the kind of film that would. If you want a big budget um, sort of disaster movie, you know, and you've, you've seen everything on Netflix along those sort of lines, do check out Skyfire. It's uh, it's a lot of fun. Our short shot this week is Dead Air. The all-girl punk band Monster Kitten managed to get passage on an old passenger plane to the final gig of their tour, little realising that the pilots are transporting some deadly cargo. Uh, very much riffing on the likes of Critters and Gremlins, this one, guys, um, with a sort of like box of uh, Chinese delights, shall we say. Um, but, you know, the, the idea of having to be soothed with a lullaby and that sort of thing and, and what happens when they get switched off. Um, I thought this was pretty decent, uh, quite un anarchic, um, a nice bit of animation to kick things off, you know, to sort of um, get around some budget constraints. I thought this worked really well. Rich? Yeah, I agree. Uh, the, uh, it's a 16 minute short British movie. The... Uh, the concept is not dissimilar to like Tail Sting that we uh, covered mm. uh, a couple, a uh, couple, three weeks back. Um, it's you know creatures being transported, uh, and then they get out, and, and all uh, you know hilarity ensues, kind of thing. It's a very neon film, which I thought was quite uh, quite good. Uh, the it's got a nice style to it. It's set in. It seems to be set in the eighties, although they don't bang you over the head about it. But the whole, you know, reliance on tape recorders uh, and cassettes mm. seem to heavily uh, indicate that, as well as the the punk rock uh, thing uh, going on with the band. Uh, cast were quite good. The hobgoblin type uh, puppet creatures were were pretty fun. Uh, I, I like that. Uh, didn't see them enough, really. I mean, they, you kind of see them a little bit more towards the end, but uh, for the most part, it's uh, turned humans basically who've um, mm. they get bitten by them and then, then they get a rather static um, makeup uh, job but the, the first girl I think it's for Charlie Bond from uh, Hellraiser gets turned first uh, and that's a really freaky makeup <laughs> that, yeah. that she's got I mean that's what's on the poster as well is, is that so that, that's it's a shame there wasn't more capacity to sort of m move uh, but the sort of CGI that they've done with the eyes, the glowing green eyes, works really quite well. Uh, and yeah, it's very, very brisk. You know, if you if you enjoy, you know, if you if you grew up loving Critters and Gremlins and stuff, 
you know, it's definitely worth a watch and uh, uh, some nice jokes and stuff in there as well. Uh, Steve, over to you, mate. Yeah. Um... Campy, good fun. Um, the creatures kind of reminded me of the ones from Labyrinth, you know, that change their own heads and stuff. Oh, yeah. Sorry, which one? Um, Labyrinth. Oh, uh, Labyrinth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, where they're swapping heads and stuff mm. like that. But, yeah, it's just what it is. What it is. Campy, bit of, bit of fun. Like Rich saying, very similar to Tales thing. Um, the manager pissed me off quite a bit. He was quite annoying. I was glad when he bought it. But, <laughs> yeah, nice bit of girl power. Is I think it was interesting that it was a female band rather than just, a lot of snotty kids. Snotty blokes, you know. Uh, <clears throat> what was, it, what was interesting they... about the band itself is what it, it seemed to be sort of manufactured in the same way that the Sex mm. Pistols were. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Because the drummer was complaining, you know, she, she's a seasoned veteran, basically, and, and sort of having to work with these people and sort of complaining, like, you know, oh, she, she can't even can't play guitar. Play. <laughs> she, she can't keep, you know. But I like the, um, I like the manager's response. She goes, oh, she, she can't even play the guitar. He's like, well, does she need to? And then sort of goes, um, the vocalist can't, you know, can't keep her knickers on. He goes, well, does she need to? <laughs> Which I thought was really good. Um, but yeah, was, that, that was an interesting. Well, the sex were manufactured. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, they were. Yeah, yeah. There was some Malcolm McLaren just sort of, you know, he 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 designed the whole oh, yeah. thing, much in the same way that the Spice Girls were. Mm-hmm. And take that for that matter. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, you know, Sex Pistols were, were yeah. How did you feel about the pilot? And pilot? Mr. Charles, yes. Uh, yeah, Dave again. Doing doing some sterling work in the front there, um, and and I like the, I like the sort of conclusion as well. You know, I, I like that sort of again. That's, that's a sort of very anarchic sort of um, ending, which, which I thought sort of was was pretty cool. So yeah, it no, quite this is how involved the pilot, or mainly the pilot, mm-hmm. how involved they were in the cargo that they were they were shipping. They're very aware of what it was. Yeah, yeah, like it, almost like it was theirs or the. Like that, I guess. I guess. Yeah, yeah like I get private, that, it was. Yeah, exactly. It's a tr- pri- private charter or something. Yeah. No. And they've but, been like, no. paid to see, right? You know what you're transporting. You shouldn't be transporting. You, you know, there's a lot of money in it for you. Get it from A to B. Exactly. Um, ask the customs yeah. and yeah. But yeah, no, it's, it's 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 a lot of fun. Some interesting punk music in it as well. I can't remember the name of the band now. Um, but Monster yeah. Kitty. Yes, uh, no, that was the name. Well, that was the name of the the band in the film, but there was there was another band who actually sort of provided the songs. Oh shit! Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> didn't know you meant that. <laughs> yeah, um, but no, good stuff. Yeah, um, thoroughly enjoyed it. I noticed in the when the credits came up, uh, Dirk Mags, uh, big big uh, guy in audio dramas and stuff. Uh, is he very you know mm. basically the top guy? He's done Batman and Spider Man and. Uh, mm. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and all that sort of stuff. They even got him on board to do like the, some of the sound stuff and you know sound mix on the film, and even I think mm. contributed some sounds for the for the creatures and stuff. So that's mm-hmm. that's quite good. They, the um, this was like a crowd funded uh, funded film, I think, for the most part, or at least for some elements of it. And I, yeah, I think those that invested in in it, I think you know they would be. I think they must be pretty happy with how it all turned out. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. Okay, so th- this is available on Amazon Prime as a short, uh, rather than YouTube or Vimeo. Um, so I think we'll put a link to the trailer. We'll, d- we'll dig out a trailer for it, hopefully, um, and and a link to the to the sort of pay site. I suppose is it is it a pay one? Must be. Uh, well, it's available if, if, you, if you're not a subscriber. Prime. That is. Prime, but I don't know yeah. if you can watch it if you're not a Prime. Mm member as of this time of recording but yeah. i think there is like an official website or something that we can link to yeah we'll, we'll do that we'll sort out okay so that is uh dead air our dtv throwback this week is a danger zone in a volatile african country an american mining engineer is duped by jim scott an old colleague and framed for causing the death of thousands of local villagers with toxic waste a year later he is given the opportunity to clear his name and find jim who has been thought to be dead um rich you do find them you really do um 
who who would have known, other than Robert Downey Jr. and De and um, Billy Zane, that they had this tucked away in their resume? Um, so when, when did this come out? It was nineteen ninety six, I believe. Uh, it was made in ninety five. Well, I think we probably got it uh, on Marquee Video in ninety six. So, yeah, ninety six. This is. You know, it, it's it's great fun. It really is. It reminded me a little bit of that film. Was, was it Colorado? Oh yeah, uh, Coronado. Yeah, Coronado. You know which one I mean. Yeah, it, yeah. it has a feel of that to it. Um, Definitely so, got that Indiana Jones romancing the stone. Little, yeah. Right. So we got um, Billy Zane as Rick Morgan. Forgot to mention his name. As um, this mining engineer who is visited um, by Jim Scott, played by Robert Downey Jr. Laying on a, a, a southern accent. Uh, yeah, with a weird accent, it has to be said. Um, you know, this, this was filmed, what, a year before Chaplin, I think? So it's an interesting sort of period for Robert Downey Jr., this, this one. Um, I think he was, yeah, I'm not sure quite where this fits in on, on, his, on his timeline, but it's definitely an unusual turn for him to... Yeah, uh, there's, a, there's a quote on him on IMDb actually where he says, um, you know, he, he basically did, he he got paid half a million dollars to, for like two weeks' work. That, that's that's basically why he took the job. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but, but the cast two, two parts of the film is in he, yeah. he appears at the beginning and then about halfway through he has another. These are quite long sequences. But, yeah, they are it, quite long. Yeah, but he's he's, he's not, not in, in and out. Movie. No, he's. <laughs> But um, the cast is superb. So, so we've got Billy Zane as our main character. We've got Robert Downey Jr. as he's mentioned, sort of popping in and out. Um, Kari uh, Hiroyuki um, Tagawa um, as Monsieur Chang uh, as, as a prominent role, and also Ron Silver as the sort of shady sort of diplomat kind of guy going on as well. And you know, this is this is from New Image. And it must have been when New Image was floating around in a lot of cash because we've got set pieces of plenty in this thing. You know, the film starts with bloody helicopter attacks and big explosions and things. And two it, helicopters are in two it. Two helicopters. <laughs> One of them gets blown up, I think. Yeah, and then we, you know, at the end of the film, we've got this whole sequence with a, with a runaway train and explosions going on and, and all sorts. It's, um, it's, it is action-packed from start to finish. Um, yeah, great cast. Uh, Lisa Collins plays Dr. Kim Woods, who's been hired by um, um, Ron Silver's character to find the missing sort of toxic waste. Um, which, because at the beginning of the film, uh, Jim Scott brought in a bunch of toxic waste to uh, Captain Scott's uh, mine where he's working. Mm. And so he's trying to but it come up to his old mate and uh, help get him to help him out. He's basically setting mm. him up. He's setting them up. He's 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 forged his signature on on the sort of export paper or the import papers for these um these barrels of toxic waste. So so when when the you know the the cops turn up as it were, you know he he's the one who gets it in the neck, almost literally because you know they were going to lynch him uh, for for his his participation. So so he leaves this country very very quickly, and then a year later he's dragged back by Ron Silver with the promise of a sort of, you know. Uh, amnesty if he can sort of track down Jim Scott's character who we everyone thought including the audience that he got blown up at the beginning uh, but it turns out he's been hiding out so yeah there's, there's a lot going on lots of really good sort of set pieces throughout it, I'm shocked that I hadn't heard of this film you know well, I'm, I'm shocked you hadn't heard of it no. I really hadn't I hadn't heard of this film at all um, I was shocked that I, I enjoyed it as much and was in, was as impressed by it, uh, revisiting hmm. it because when it came out, and I think I bought, I, I think I watched it when I bought an X rental, uh, you know, sometime after it had come out on Big Box, uh, and you know, I watched it. It was fine, but I never, I never really thought about it again. Hmm. Uh, but you watch it going, you know, watching the kind of action movies that we do now from the sort of low budget realms, and you go back and see that, and it's like you can tell it's, it, you can tell it's a low budget, really not really made for the cinema movie. Yeah, but as you but say, even the so, production yeah. value is immense. Um, in ter so we'll, uh, I'm going to reference Rogue uh, again because that was uh, mm. when we started. Well, coincidentally, both these films are made in South Africa, and uh, that film I'm going to, uh, you know, what I was saying about the extraction thing and the jumping off the waterfall. 
so that visual effect and, and they do a jumping off the water they do a jumping do a jumping off the flip. bridge yeah in, into the into the river uh well i think they jump through off a waterfall as well in this one. Oh yeah yeah but that's true there's a couple of re basically there's two or three high jumps in this that are done properly for real which look really great uh, and we've got window dives uh we've mm. got, you know driving there's one bit where they do show they're saving the budget which is uh, there's a bit with the train explosion at the end where they basically cut away and, and you don't really see it but you know that's a quite for big forgivable thing the amazing stunt not, not saying not amazing but you know like really good mm. quality stunts beautiful locations uh, the cast is impressive uh, billy zane is on top form here he's he's very charming and you know perfect hero this is around the same time he was doing the phantom which was a similar kind of setup yeah, uh, with um, Christy Swanson, I think was the was the um, woman he was in with that one. Ron Silver is doing Ron Silver. Yeah, he did a couple mm. of new movies. This and Time uh, Cop and all sorts. Yeah, he did Deadly yeah. Takeover with Jake's, Jeff Speakman, but Time Cop is the one he's most well known for. And Blue Steel uh, with yeah, uh, mm. as, um, but he's like soft. Sorry. I think he's he's so softly spoken that he had to ADR all his lines. <laughs> He said he looks dubbed in every single scene that he's in, mm. but it seems to be his voice. The, there's a, in another sort of callback to, to talking about Rogue, there's a CGI bit where they shoot a deer, which just mm. seems really obviously CG, but I suppose that's the only way you could kind of do it. But they, I think they probably would have been better off not showing it, just, oh, you know, know what's happened, but not actually yeah. showing it. That just mm. looks a bit now. But very minor fault. Um, uh, yeah, the comparisons Coronado and and you know films with that sort of high adventure sort of dynamic, uh, very good. He, there's a bit of a a bit where he rides with the rebels kind of things, mm. maybe like uh, Living Daylights. And I think they did it in Rambo Three, possibly as well. Um, the train finale is essentially New Image trying to copy what was two of the biggest hits around the time: Broken Arrow and Under Siege two um again i can forgive it that that's fine uh it's it, it's just a really very entertaining movie and i bought it on dvd coincidentally several weeks ago with thinking about us potentially covering it because it wasn't mm. available online and then it turned up on amazon prime it's a, and unlike the dvd uh, based on a, a similar to the vhs which was pan and scan the the version online is uh is for is the widescreen version which looks even better yeah yeah it was it's a very handsome looking film um this is directed by a guy called alan eastman who um, has a long career as um, a tv director he's done you know throughout the 90s he, he was on just about every sort of action and sort of horror tv show uh do, doing stuff did a bit of star trek along the way um so so yeah a very seasoned director Given this seems to be like the only film he's done from I think so. It's the only, it's the only feature, um, I think, on, the, on his IMDb page. But, um, yeah, so so this is, you know, again, it, it, Rich has done a great thing here. He's, he's, he's dug out another sort of gem on, um, on Amazon Prime, um, easily overlooked on Amazon Prime. You know, they, they don't do a good job of sort of putting the picture... Um, for it uh, when you look it up I was sort of going is is this the film that Rich has mentioned but yeah it sure is <laughs> um, so yeah there it is it's on Amazon Prime as Rich has said it's a nice widescreen print it looks great uh, from New Image um, it, it's you know if, if you're a fan of that sort of action film it, it's definitely definitely worth checking out great yeah. cast you know great to see um, Robert Downey Jr. in that period Billy Zane looking great um, what more could you ask for, really? Lots of plot twists and turns as well. Yeah. It's not a very, it's not a completely straightforward story, which I also appreciated. Absolutely. So go check it out. It's uh, Danger Zone on Amazon Prime. There you go. So that is the end of this week's show. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you to Steve and Rich for joining me this evening. Thank you, sir. We shall put all the links. No problem. We shall put all the links into the footnotes as usual. Um, do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at the DTV, DTV Digest. So please do. Thank you for listening and tune in again next time. Thank you.
Thank you for listening to the DTV Digest. Let us know your thoughts in the comments and tune in again next time.